Today we're going to begin a new sermon series on the book of Romans. It's a good sign. Nobody got up and walked out in terms of Romans. <laughs> I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear we're beginning a sermon series on the book of Romans. Maybe there's some, wow, boy, that's a, that's a big book. But we're going to be breaking it up, so we're not going to just you know, have Romans, you know, like 20 sermons that are going to be back to back and it's going to be drinking out of a fire hose. We're going to try to take time and follow the themes in Romans. So we'll spend uh, three weeks starting next week. We're going to look at the problem of sin in Romans, which is a big part of what Paul has to say. Then we're going to look at what it means to be saved by faith for the next three weeks after that. Then we're going to take a break for Advent, celebrate the coming of Christ, and then we're going to come back into Romans and discuss what it means to have new life in Christ. We are saved to ultimately live a new life, but how do we do that? What does that look like? Paul has a lot to say about that. And then we'll conclude by looking at the call of God to live for Jesus. So we'll take breaks here and there. And uh, so I just want to thank you. Some of you might say, why in the world would we do this? Uh, and, and I want to share a little bit that this is not something just Friday at midnight. I was sitting here going, what do I preach? Let's just do this. Uh, that's really not the focus. In fact, for over two months, I've been reading in Romans. I've been slowly reading in commentaries and just actually kind of had some moments to say, God, do you really want me to do this? <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this. This is a big task. But I really have felt that this is important for our church family to study God's word closely together. It's been said, one author says this, that the letter to the Romans is a book that repeatedly changes the world by changing people. Countless human lives have been changed. And, and, I'll, and I'll share more in the week to come. There's some key leaders in the church through the centuries that were changed by their study of Romans. And God went on to use them to impact the world and, and history in profound ways. So I think it's important that we, that we spend time studying God's word in the book of Romans uh, and I think it's important in part because we need to remember, and I'm going to speak some to believers here. We have believers and unbelievers every Sunday who gather, and we're glad that you're here. But I want to narrow in on our believers. I want to remind you that we believe that the Word of God is our rule of faith and practice. That's accepted commonly by Christians through the ages, but even in our own denomination, it's actually in our covenant of Christian character that we say we believe that the word of God is our rule for faith, what we believe and what we do. Amen. We look to God's word first, but we also, we believe God's truth is revealed in many ways, primarily through his word, which is our trustworthy guide when rightly interpreted, but also reason, experience, tradition. There are multiple ways that we come to understand God's word. And so we do believe that we should study science. We do believe in reason, but we also believe that those things aren't at odds with God's word. But God's word is our authoritative guide. That's been a pillar of the church from the very beginning, that God has spoken to us through his word, the Holy Scripture. So we need to rediscover that. And I think really looking closely at Romans is one way that will help us with that. We also need to rediscover with clarity the message of good news. This is really important. Uh, we are a gospel people. We are called to share good news. But we need to understand as a church what that message is. And we need to rediscover how to communicate it to an ever-changing culture. And I don't want to just assume that because I'm a pastor or because I come to church every week that I know this message. I want to invite you to study God's word deeply for yourself. I really want you not just to come and be like, we're going to come listen to Pastor Mark. He's got a direct channel, a direct line to God. Pastors don't have a direct line to God. It's with fear and trembling. We come and we know that we're going to give an account, but we're human too. And I want to encourage you, if you're just relying on what I say to you about God's word and God's truth, or if you're relying on what you hear other people say, you're going to miss the mark. Study God's word for yourself. There are so many resources today. 
wonderful resources that make the Bible understandable. There's great translations. And if you don't know where to start, there's great study Bibles. There's lay accessible commentaries. If you want to study God's word for yourself and you just don't know what to do, uh, please text me. Say, hey, do you have a rec- something you can recommend for me? And I'd be happy to recommend. But, but don't take it for granted that what I'm saying is true. Study it yourself. Uh, and know that, know that God wants to meet you through the study of his word because he loves you. And so I want to challenge you to that. We need to know what God's will is. That's why I think it's so important we spend this time. We need to know what we should believe and what we should do. And we need to know how to interpret our ever-changing culture through the timeless, unchanging principles of God's word. God's word is truth, and and, and the principles in God's word, the teaching in God's word, do not change. And and that's so important that while our culture is changing every day, that we are going back to the foundation of everything we believe and do, which is God's word. And we're interpreting and looking at our culture through the lens of God's word. We need to rediscover that as a church. You know, one of my boys the other day came home, and we were... I cooked some wings on the grill. I discovered that, man, I, I can grill like a whole bunch of wings on my Weber gas grill. And, you know, you basically get them with seasoning, and I pull them off, and then I get this container, and I get like the B-Dubs Honey Barbecue, which is my favorite, and I shake them in that barbecue, and it tastes just like B-Dubs, B-dubs but it doesn't cost as much. And so we were eating them, and they were so good, and my son Isaiah is like, man, Dad, these wings are bussin' bussin'. And I just kind of had this moment where I looked over at him, and I'm like... I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, what are you saying? And he's like, well, everybody says bus and bus and when something's really good. I'm like, okay, well, I have no idea. I've never heard of that. So apparently I found out, how many of you have heard that phrase? Bus and bus and. Okay, most of our younger people or uh, public school teachers or uh, there's some teachers here, okay? So how many have not heard of that phrase? Okay, thank you, the majority of us. So the reality is like, I mean, it's funny, you can laugh when you were a teenager. There's things, the culture's always changing. Like, I mean, it's, it's rapidly changing. And we need to be a people that are rooted in God's word. We don't need to put our fingers in our ears and ignore the culture. We need to listen to our culture because we're trying to reach all people with the good news of Jesus Christ. But we need to make sure that our anchor is in the timeless principles of God's word. And we need to know what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to live a Christian life? One of the things that I think is a mark of when somebody truly comes to faith in Christ is there is a hunger for God's word. I've seen that over and over. I've seen it when when somebody comes to faith in Christ, all of a sudden there's this passion to, to want to know what God's word teaches. There's a hunger for God's word. Can I encourage you, if you've been a believer for a long time, refan refan those flames. Renew that commitment to long for God's word. Study his word. Seek to know. Don't take somebody's interpretation for just granted. Seek to understand what God says through his word. And I want to challenge you for that. And then lastly, we need to make sure our mission is in line with God's mission. Paul has a lot to say He's an example of of a missionary, uh, planning churches all throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. And we need to make sure that the mission that we're called to and what we're doing is in line with God's mission. We need to make sure that if we start to get off course to the right or to the left, that once again we allow God's word through his spirit to bring us back. And this isn't just together as a church, but it's personally. Why do you live? If you're a believer in Jesus, what has he called you to do? Are you doing that? And be very careful to trust yourself. I don't trust myself. That's why I need to read God's word, because I don't trust my own abilities and understandings. But are, but are you in step with him? So I think that's part, all those things together are, there's more, but why I believe it's so important that we would take time to journey through this book to Paul's life. It really isn't even a letter. It is a letter, but it's big enough that it's a book. I mean, if somebody wrote you a letter this long, you'd call it a book, because that's pretty much what it is. So 
I want to share with you from the prologue, the very beginning of Paul's book to the Roman church. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 17 in uh, chapter, uh, the very beginning of the book here. And, and I want to share with you the main idea. Uh, if I could capture the main idea here, we're going to go back a slide here, if you could, Cindy. Uh, go back another slide. Uh, the main idea here is, go back one more, please. If you go to the first slide, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. The good news we all need is a who, not a what. That's the main idea. When we look at Romans 1, verse 1 through 17, the good news that everyone needs, the gospel, the good news that every human being needs is a who, not a what. And that's what Paul emphasizes here. And we're going to unpack that together. And we're going to do that in this way by looking at different aspects of that, that the good news is about Jesus, is for everyone, and has power to change your life. That's what Paul hits on in, these, in the opening. And this is very important because everything else he writes about is related to this. The good news is all about Jesus. And this good news is for every human being. And it has power to change your life. We're going to look at that together today. So let's start by looking at the good news is all about Jesus. Verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read those to you. You can listen along or follow along on the screen. Paul says here, this is a letter from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The, the good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us this privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you, you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you all, or all of you in Rome, who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So what is it that Paul is saying here when he says the good news is all about Jesus? He said that he was born as a human being. He was born of the line of David. So Paul makes this point crystal clear that Jesus is a human being. He's not part human. He is fully human, but yet as he goes on, he makes this also clear that Jesus isn't just a human being, he is divine. And he says the statement that he was showed to be the son of God in power at the moment of his resurrection. So this does not mean that Jesus was human throughout his whole life, and then he became the son of God at the very end when he was raised. No, he was the son of God. He always has been the son of God. The eternal son of God became human. And it was at his death and resurrection that his divinity was displayed for the whole world to see when God raised him from the dead. It proved, it made who Jesus really is manifest for every person in all time, in all places to see that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is human. So this good news that, that, that is for all people, that's for you, that's for me, it reminds us that Jesus, it's all about Jesus who is God and man. And then Paul says, I love this phrase, he is Jesus Christ our Lord. So this good news is about Jesus who is human and divine, but God desires for you to know this Jesus Christ personally. And that is inseparable from the gospel. It's not just historical facts, which it is that. It's absolutely historical, but it's meant to be experienced personally. Jesus is in your life. Jesus wants you to know him as he really is. 
the word that was with God in the beginning that was God, that is God, who created all things, who holds all things together, Jesus Christ, who is God and man, he is our Lord. And then Paul says, this Lord has brought us grace and peace. Now, a lot of times we kind of skip over this because it's just kind of like, we think it's just a greeting. Like when you write a letter, you just say something nice in there, like, oh, you know, you know blessings or sincerely warm regards, best wishes. That's what we think is going on here. But no, 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 these are huge theological concepts. And Paul's saying, look, God has brought grace and peace, this idea of shalom in the Old Testament, that human flourishing, everything that sin has touched, God in the, in his, in the Son, Jesus Christ, has brought grace and peace to all human beings. And we can know that grace and peace if we'll turn to Jesus Christ personally in our hearts. And we'll trust in him as our Savior and our Lord. And there's also this sense of, well, that sounds great, but the world doesn't look like grace and peace right now. Well, well, as Christians, we proclaim that, yes, this peace that God gives and this grace, you can experience it now, but we also proclaim it's not going to fully be accomplished till Jesus returns. The reason the world is broken and so messed up right now is because of humanity's own rebellion against God, our creator. It's because of what we've done, the sin, the evil that we have brought upon God's creation that's affected everything. But in Jesus, with his death and resurrection, sin and death have been defeated. The victory's already won. Yes, we still grieve loss. Yes, we still have pain. But we know that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he will say, behold, I make all things new again. That's our hope. That's the Christian hope. And it's because we have that hope of Christ's return that we're absolutely confident of, we have hope to share with people now. And we work for that right now because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this good news is what this book in Romans specifically, but the whole Bible is all about. It is all about Jesus Christ. Jesus is our message Jesus is the good news. But secondly, we're going to look at verses 8 through 15 here. The good news about Jesus is for everyone. This is inescapable. What God has done in Christ is not for a small select group of privileged religious people. What God has done in Jesus Christ is for every single human being who's ever lived. Look at at what he says here. We're going to look at this, verse 8 through 15. Paul says, Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you. But I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome to preach the good news. You see, this gospel, the good news, is for everyone. And we can see this uh, right here in in Paul's example. What's interesting about the Church of Rome and what we know about it is Paul's writing this letter in AD 57. So he's writing this letter, you know, just about 27 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So this is really close. And already by that time, there's a church in Rome. Paul introduces himself because they, they don't know Paul. Maybe they heard of him, But these Christians in Rome, they don't even know who Paul is. 
So Paul takes so much time to introduce himself. Likely the church in Rome is the product in part of after Pentecost when Peter preached that first message of the gospel after the resurrection of Jesus on that official beginning of the mission of the church, the birthday of the church, if you will, that several who were in Jerusalem, likely Jewish people, to celebrate the Passover, heard the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus, and they believed, and they trusted in Jesus. Well, then they went back, all the way back to where they were from. And it's likely that because of that, this church in Rome was already forming. And Paul says, listen, everybody, the church all throughout the Roman Empire is talking about your faith. Now, we might think that means that, oh, man, that church has really got it happening in Rome. Their face is better than ours. No, it's the fact. The reason everybody's talking about it is, can you believe it? Jesus, you know, who, who was crucified and raised, it's only been 27 years, and already there's a church in Rome. I mean, see the explosiveness of the growth of Christianity. And there's this overwhelming sense. Have you heard that there's Christians in Rome of all places? And so Paul writes this letter. And he's writing, and, and you'll notice that he desires to come to Rome. Why does he want to go to Rome? Because he wants to share more about the gospel, and he actually wants to use Rome to launch out even further west to Spain. Because Paul's convinced that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is for the educated and the uneducated. The Jew and the Gentile, male, female, every person who's ever lived this good news about Jesus is for everyone. And I want you to look at the example of Paul. Maybe we can learn something from Paul today and his example. So if I were writing you a letter and you don't know who I am, you've never met me, <laughs> and I'm just some random dude, and I pick up a pen and a piece of paper and I write you a big letter, how I introduce myself is going to be really important, right? Whether you're going to listen to anything I have to say. So how does Paul introduce himself here? I want you to notice that Paul is prayerful. Verses 8 and 9, that's the first thing he talks about. He says, I pray day and night for you. He's writing to Christians, the church in Rome. He's praying day and night for these believers. And then in verse 9, notice he's committed. He is committed, he says, to serving God with all of his heart. The reason he prays is because he's so committed to serving God with all his heart. And the way he's serving God, Paul says, is to spread the good news to everyone. The good news about Jesus. Paul is so deeply, deeply committed for that. But notice how humble he is, verse 10 through 12. He says, I want to come to Rome because I want to strengthen you. He wants to strengthen the Roman church. But what's fascinating is in verse 12, he says, I want, to be I want to strengthen your faith. But then he says, I want my faith to be strengthened by you. There's a powerful lesson there. I mean, an incredibly powerful lesson. This is the Apostle Paul. He is one of those who himself was an eyewitness to the risen Lord with his conversion on the road to Damascus. This is the Apostle Paul. And he's not condescending here and saying, look, I'm coming to strengthen you because I'm the Apostle Paul. Do you hear what he said? He says, I also want my faith to be encouraged. I'll tell you, a lot of times when we try to do good for Christ and we try to encourage somebody who's either not a believer or in a believer, we do more damage when we think we're God's gift to that person or that problem. We need to take a humble posture, and Paul does that. I mean, here's this new Roman church, like, hey, I want to strengthen your faith, but I also need my faith to be encouraged. How much would that affect our relationships in the church if we did that? Like, hey, hey, can I encourage you? I want to share something with you, but I'm not just coming to share. I, I, being with you is a blessing to me. I'm looking to be encouraged. See the humility of the Apostle Paul. Look at his patience, verse 13. He says, I want to come to you, <laughs> but I've been prevented. It's an interesting phrase here. It actually means that Paul is saying, look, I have been planning and I'm trying to get to Rome, but I'm being prevented. What he's saying is God hasn't opened the door yet. How many times have you felt that God's calling you to something, but yet it's not the right time? How many times when that happens, when God doesn't answer that prayer right away, we're like, well, you know what? I'm going to go pray for something else because that didn't work. 
Here's the Apostle Paul saying, I have been praying and I long to come to you. This has been a passion in my heart and I'm still praying and I'm still hoping. But up until now, he says, I've been prevented. It's not been, God is sovereign, God is providential. And there's this desire in my heart to come to strengthen your faith. But I'm trusting God for that time. We do know Paul eventually makes it to Rome. We know that and beyond. But here when he's writing, he's longing, but he hasn't gone. And then lastly, he's focused here. Verse 14, why does he want to come? He knows his message. He is focused on the good news about Jesus Christ. And he's focused on living, teaching, and spreading the good news of Jesus to all people. It's amazing. We don't, these people don't know the Apostle Paul, but already by the way he's writing, you can tell a lot about Paul, can't you? you? You can understand who he is. I just want to ask you, it's easy to gloss over this, but does this describe our level of commitment as a local church? Look at Paul's example. Look at his life. Does this describe us? Are we prayerful? Are we committed? Are we humble? Are we patient? Are we focused? Does this describe your level of commitment? Can we all just say, help me, Jesus? <laughs> help me, Jesus. That's what I say. This is encouraging, and it's challenging me to walk as a real follower of Jesus. And the final point I want to share with you, so we've already looked, the good news is all about Jesus. We've looked at the good news is for everyone. And then here in verse 16 and 17, we see that the good news about Jesus has power to change your life. There's a, there's a really specific reality to this verse. That what God has done in Christ hasn't just changed the trajectory of history and of the world and of all people. Specifically, there is power in the good news of Jesus Christ to change your and my life. This is the essence of the good news. That's why we gather. If this wasn't true, we'd pack it up and say, let's go watch football. So that's kind of where we're at. But, but the reality here is the good news has power to change. Let's look at it together. Paul says in verse 16 through 17, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. That's two verses that it's worth memorizing. I'm not ashamed of the good news about Jesus Christ. This good news is all about Jesus. It's for everyone. God makes us right with him by faith from A to Z, from the moment you first believe in Christ and trust in him, turning away from your sins and turning to Jesus to, to save you and to make you right with God, your creator, to enter into a love relationship with God who created you from the very beginning to the day you breathe your last breath, it's faith. <laughs> faith from beginning to end. It's a relationship of trust and depending upon God. It's walking with Jesus who is Lord and Savior, knowing him personally. That's what the gospel is all about. And it's for all people. Paul is fearless here. He proclaims this message, and it's fascinating that, that Paul is fearless. He uses this word that in an unbelieving world, keep in mind the Apostle Paul uh, is writing to Rome. Roman culture, Greco-Roman culture, when you study it, um, it, it makes our culture today not look so bad. <laughs> Still, we, our culture is really in desperate need of God. But when you look back, there's this thought that the good old days have always been good. But go back to first century Greco-Roman culture, and you'll experience some things that are, that are shocking. And you'll see that the world then, Paul says, I'm not afraid. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. And, and let, me, let me make this really personal, because I think we just read this detached. Part of the reason Paul is not afraid is Paul himself has had a life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul was Saul of Tarsus. 
He was a devout Jew who specifically made it his personal mission to put to death those who claimed the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul himself was responsible for the intense violence and persecution done against the early church. Paul himself stood by at the stoning of the apostle Stephen. This is Saul. But yet God, in his faithfulness, as he is with all people, convicted and revealed himself to Paul, and Paul responded to the Lord Jesus Christ by placing all of his trust in him, and his life is dramatically changed. So let me tell you this. If you really believe what we're reading today, then you won't be ashamed of this message. Because this message isn't a do better, try harder message. This message is all about what God has already done for you. That in spite of your sin and my sin, that God loves you so much that he would send his son to be the perfect sacrifice, to literally pay the penalty we deserve for our sins. And Jesus wasn't like forced to do that. Jesus said, this is the whole reason I came. Remember he prayed that. He said, this is why I came. No one takes my life from me. Jesus said that. I lay my life down as a ransom. So this this is the good news. It's it's personal. And God wants you to know that personally. This is the salvation that you need, that I need. Paul's not ashamed. He's not ashamed. He's confident that every human being needs to be saved. Now you may sit here today and say, I don't need to be saved. I'm a pretty decent person. Um, There's good in all of us. There is. There's this reality of common grace that even people who don't believe in Christ are capable of great things, good things, because of the grace of God that is given commonly. But we all need to be saved. Um, We're going to start the next three weeks. We're going to spend three weeks, and I'm going to show you the the slide of where we're going on the problem of sin. Um, I wasn't really excited about this part. (laughs) Romans 1, chapter 1, through about halfway through chapter 3. And the purpose of this part of Romans is not for us to sit there and go, yeah, that person's sitting next to me. See, I told you so. No. Especially if it's your spouse. Please don't do that. (laughs) But the reality of Romans 1 through 3 is I'm in chapter 8 now in my own studies. There's this daily awareness of how deep and big the problem of sin actually is. The problem of sin in the world and the problem of sin in my life is a whole lot bigger than you or I often think it is. And we desperately need to be saved. And all people need Jesus. So that's the main point. We all need Jesus. So if we get through Romans 1 through 3, (laughs) my prayer is we'll all be at a place to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. And then Paul talks about what it means to be saved by faith. And so we're going to get there. But I think it's important that we, once again, rediscover the righteousness of God in humanity's own sinfulness. We need to rediscover that. It challenges how we might view our culture. It challenges how we might view our own need. But I hope that it results in you and I prayerful, (laughs) aware of our own need and our own lostness apart from Christ and deeply thankful for what God has done in Jesus for us. The good news about Jesus reveals how we can be made right. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. From faith to faith, from beginning to end, we can be made right with God. You see, this good news is all about Jesus. It's for everyone, which means you and me, and it has power to change your life. So let me encourage you, don't tune me out at the beginning here. Will you take this journey with me? Will you mark, get a new Bible. If you don't want to mark up your Bible, mark up your Bible. Write down your questions and say, I'm going to search this out. And I want to study God's word to see what God really is saying here. Take this journey with me. And my prayer is that God will draw us all closer to Jesus through this. And if you don't know Jesus, my hope and prayer is that week by week, There'll be some of you who will turn for the very first time in faith. From from your heart, you'll cry out to Jesus. And you'll know, you'll come to know what it means to know that you're made right by faith. That you have salvation, that you've been forgiven. And I hope all of us will rediscover the message of good news through this series. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to 
to conclude our service today, uh, I just want to pray, um, and then we're going to sing a song. That song is going to prepare us to share in communion today. Um, communion is one of the ways that we believe is a means of grace. Don't believe there's anything magical in the bread or the juice, but we do believe that Jesus has promised that every time we gather at his table, Jesus promised that he would be with us. So has God spoken to you in any day, any way today? Is there any way that he's showing you a need in your heart? I just want to encourage you that when you participate in communion with me, from your heart, participate in the grace of God that is for you. Taking communion reminds us that we desperately need Jesus. Every week, it reminds us that apart from this sacrifice, this display of love, where would I be? Who would I be? If the word was not made flesh, oh man, what would my life be like? Jesus and what he's done for us. I want to encourage you to specifically uh, to make that an act of worship. And if you're new today and say, I'd just rather not participate yet, that is okay. During this time of worship, just know that we're glad you're here. Like I said, we got believers and unbelievers every Sunday here, and we're thrilled that you are with us. And we want this to be a place that you can belong, that you know that we love you. We're glad you're here. And so feel free to pass up. Or if you just, for whatever reason, don't want to participate, just take this time to worship. Um, and you should have received communion when you came in today. Did anyone not get a cup of individually wrapped communion? Raise your hand. We have one person over here, Roxanne. Do you mind helping Becky over here? We'll make sure she gets a, a cup here. Let's go ahead and pray, and then let's take this song. Um, we're going to sing this song. I'm going to have you stand and just go ahead and stand right now, actually, if you would. And if you would like to pray from where you are to prepare your heart, feel free to. Know that our altars are always open that if you would just like to, just before God, just take a moment to, maybe that posture would really help you today just to come and, and recommit your life to Christ or to pray about something, please feel free to do that as well during this song. And then after the song, we'll share in communion together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We have gathered today to not just be entertained or to be inspired. Father, we have gathered because we need you. And our, we are hungry to really, truly know the God who has created us, who loves us, who has called us into relationship with himself. And Father, today as we pray, uh, as we share in this meal together, we remember that sharing a meal is something you do with friends. It's something you do with people that you belong with. And we are so humbled to think that Jesus, that your death, your resurrection was all about helping us find our way home to you. So Jesus, uh, I pray that if there's anyone here today that is living in this life as though they're not loved, that they don't have an identity, that they're confused there, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would hear you calling them, inviting them to believe. Through your spirit, would you apply to their heart the truth that it was for me that Christ came, that Christ died and Christ was raised. This good news is for every person here today. And I pray that each one of us would truly respond in faith today. We need to respond believing and trusting and placing all our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So even as we sing this song today in Christ alone, I pray that this would be a, an act of worship in our hearts as we prepare our hearts for communion. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship and sing.